welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast of board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. And this is episode 281, Three Steps to Playing Remotely. We'd like to thank all of our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode, but especially David Cooper, my friend, you rock. All right, Anthony, here we are with a brand new episode talking about how to play board games remotely. This is one of the challenges that we're dealing with right now since we can't all be at the table together, but we still want to play physical board games at the table. Yeah, it's a funny thing. Like, we we ran a few episodes back in March and April about how to play games online, the best websites to play games online, reviewing some of those games. And three months later... I mean, I'm still doing it a little bit, but not like the four or five nights a week I was doing it then. And I think a lot of people are in the same boat. It You just miss the tactile. You want to touch the stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you, like, I'd sit in this office with like 200 board games around me and I'm sitting here playing like a digital version of one of them. I'm like, this sucks. I don't want to do this anymore. So, and obviously no detriment to those websites. Board Game Arena, all, Tabletopia, all that stuff is making it possible to play, which... We couldn't at all at a certain point, but there's something to be said for playing a real game. So we kind of dove in and tried to put together our best guide for how to do that, having tested it and done it a few times ourselves and worked through a few kinks and recognized a few issues and recognized a few cool spots as well. So it'll be fun to kind of talk through how to actually do that physically. Absolutely. We want to get those games back out to the tables. All right, but Anthony, before we get into that feature review, there is a lot of stuff going on in board gaming. Obviously, conventions are going online, and we'll bring you those updates as they happen. And especially the state of the board game industry as different publishers are trying to get their games out and trying to find ways to distribute those games out, either through the local friendly game stores or through online. And as many of them wait and push back their upcoming releases to a more reasonable time when they get them in the hands there is so much that's happening so please stay with us as we bring you those updates we already talked about the games that will be coming out soon and we'll bring you another update i know that's really important for everybody out there because since we don't have conventions you want to have the most up-to-date information and we're here every week with you but anthony we did have a review or I guess, in fact, an awards, Dice Tower Awards, and they uh, recently were given out. Yeah, I mean, this the show will go on, as they say, and the, the Dice Tower Awards went up as usual. I think it was part of their summer extravaganza um, online version of, I'm not 100% sure what, <laughs> what the analog <laughs> is for that, but basically, they usually have the Dice Tower um, convention every year the 4th of July weekend, obviously that was canceled. So they did something online instead. And that's where they announced the award winners. So these went up last week and it's like one of the later awards of the year, other than like the Spiel des Jahres, which is a whole different beast. And part of that is the nominations. We don't start doing that until like February or March. And the voting doesn't happen until end of May, beginning of June. Um, We are both on the voting quote unquote committee. So (laughs) we did vote on these among, you know, a few dozen other people. And it's kind of a fun little community and you get like a very diverse group of opinions kind of going into this. So it's always fun to see how these come out and how close or not close they are to our own ultimate, you know, picks. Right. But wingspan won what two awards out of the 13, 14. So it wasn't. Yeah. It won the most important awards, best new designer for uh, Elizabeth Hargrave and best game of the year. Real quick. Just want to run through kind of what won what and you know, Obviously, if you have any comments, chime in. But best artwork went to Parks. This is what I voted for. I just beautiful, fantastic artwork from the 59 Park series. Love this. Love this game. The game itself is pretty light. It's a family thing, but artwork is fantastic. Board game production went to Cloud Spire. And sure, I don't know. I haven't really, <laughs> I haven't really played any of these. I own Batman, the board game, but I never played it. And in terms of production, I would just say it's a lot of stuff. I don't know if it's like the best stuff. It's just a lot of it. Tapestry is overproduced Funko strategy game is just Funko's on a board. Um, so <laughs> cloud spire makes sense because anytime chip theory is nominated for production, they should win. Cooperative game went to horrified. Uh, 
I actually played a few of these horrified Lord of the Rings and Marvel champions. Uh, I'm actually okay with this horrified. It's like a fun, cute, you know, solidly. Um, it's very well themed uh, family game. Did you ever end up playing this one with your family? No, I haven't gotten a copy of it yet. Yeah, I think they like it. I mean, it's old movie monsters. So it's not really a horror game. You know, it's a good fit for just family groups. This expansion went to the Quacks of Quedlinburg expansion. Terraforming Mars Turmoil. I know you hate, and I was like, it's fine. <laughs> so definitely didn't vote for that. Seven Wonders Armada is fantastic, but I haven't really gotten to play it much. And then the Underwater Cities expansion, I haven't. I still haven't played the multiplayer parts of it. So... Yeah, there was a. I think that was of all the categories that were out there. I thought that was the best of the year. I I, I think that's, you know, every you know every once in a while we've been doing this for it's going to be seven years now. There are just some years that you know one or two categories really take off and they really represent what's the best about our industry. And this year, I think it was just expansions. I think there was just a lot of great expansions. So no matter where you went, as far as expansions are concerned. Those have been the standouts. Obviously, Best New Designer, I think that's also a standout. And obviously, Game of the Year, that's always a standout. But beyond that, I I think that, you know, it it had been a so-so year for board gaming in 2019. Yeah. It's, again, another one of those years with, like, a whole bunch of sevens and eights. But, like, no home run 10.0 board game. And we don't need that every year. It's fine. It's just, it makes it a little bit harder to point to, like, this is the best game of the year. If sure everything's kind of in the same bracket. All right, running through the rest of these real quick. Best family game went to Point Salad, which is great. I love Point Salad, but I was a little surprised because Wingspan was nominated for that, as was Tiny Towns and Parks. All of those very popular. Um, you mentioned Best New Designer went to Elizabeth Hargrave. Absolutely should have. I'm glad it did. Best game from a small publisher, Res Arcana, which, yeah, <laughs> I'm on board with that. Uh, I, I love that game. It's fantastic. Best party game went to Wavelength. This, again, one I didn't expect to win. Just, I don't know why, but it just came out. Not enough people necessarily got a chance to try it out. It was Kickstarter only. It's just now hitting the stores. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's really good, though. Like, I don't tend to love party games, but this is a really good one. Best reprint went to Pret-a-Porter. Um, this is the one I disagreed with, I think. Uh, PAX Premier 2nd Edition isn't just a reprint. It is just like ev- literally everything about that game is better. Um, Predator Porter, none of its other prints even have that many in print. So this is like most people's first experience with the game. Not that that's bad. It just makes it hard to say it's a best reprint because it improves X, Y, Z. It's like, well, it didn't, you can't get it anywhere. It's been out of print forever. <laughs> Pax Premier is just like, you know, 10 steps ahead. And it was my game of the year last year. So, you know, a little biased. <laughs> um, best solo game went to Journeys of Middle Earth, the Lord of the Rings. Um, I'm fine with that. I, I've played it solo. I actually play this two player mostly. Uh, I played Marvel Champions solo far more. And in my opinion, it's the best solo deck builder uh, that they have or LCG that they have. So eh, it's fine. <laughs> the other two are just big boxes of miniatures. I wasn't going to play. Best strategy game was a tough category. Maracaibo won. And I think I'm a little warmer on this game than you are, but I don't think either one of us thinks it's like a home run, right? It's a fine game. It, it just runs longer than it probably should yeah for sure yeah my pick there would have been city of the big shoulders which was our game of the year last year paladins is also good watergate is fantastic but i don't know if it's quite heavy enough to sit in that category on its own yeah and i think that category in general has always been challenging because there's a lot of strategy games that are just light to medium euros and then there's heavy strategy games you know like the idea the difference of like tactics versus strategy or a 2.0 decent you know, strategy game versus like a three or a four. There's a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Comparing city of the big shoulders to Watergate is, I don't know. I, I find it hard to wrap my head around that one. Sure. Best theming went to horrified hundred percent. Okay. With that um, wingspan, I would also have been very okay with it. Was, it's a very strongly themed game. Best two player game Watergate. Yes. 100%. Although I do have several friends who would, uh, throw down for Undaunted Normandy, which I haven't had a chance to play yet, but I've only heard good things. So I do hope to play that someday <laughs> once we're out of all this. And then most innovative game, Detective City of Angels. This is another one I've heard a lot of very good things about, but I've not had a chance to play. I'd actually not played any of these innovative games. So who knows which one I think would win. But 
yeah, this one looks interesting, and I like detective stuff. Yeah, so overall, a, a decent year, 2019, and some surprises, and obviously a lot of games to check out and get to your table this year. So if you haven't played these games, we definitely recommend them. Uh, everything on the list, actually everything on the list, including the winners, especially the winners, definitely uh, deserves a checkout. All right, so that's what's going on with the industry, Anthony, but the, we still have some stuff that's going on with BGA. Maybe something for our Patreon backers? Yeah, so obviously we've been running a Patreon for a very long time. We mention it every week, and we appreciate everybody who backs, especially David this week, brand new to the, the Patreon. We wanted to just throw a quick reminder out to everybody that we post brand new bonus episodes every week now to the Patreon. And those are available to anybody at the $5 tier or higher. And these episodes, what we started doing is alternating back and forth between each of our collections. So Chris started this. It was his idea to kind of launch this puppy. And each week, it's going to be volume one and then volume one for the other one. So Chris, then me, then Chris, then me. Kind of just running through all the games in our collection, like where we got them, why we have them, why we haven't played them. If we have played them, are they worth keeping? You know, like, and some of the things that come up are almost revelations to us because there's a lot of games you kind of forget <laughs> that you own. <laughs> you know, you're like, hey, I I could see why I own two 18xx games. Why do I have five of these? <laughs> I'm not going to play the other three. <laughs> so there's a lot of really cool stuff for us as well as you. And it's just kind of a fun, quick, like 30 minute episodes once a week, trying to put those up every Sunday. So you have them at the start of the week. And yeah, they're free to anybody at the $5 tier or higher on Patreon and you can get the RSS feed and load them up on your phone. Yeah, so feel free to check those episodes out, plus all the other episodes, all the other content. Join us on Slack so we can talk more directly and you can kind of rip us on our collections a little bit. Uh, obviously, how Anthony has way too many 18 X games and I have none. So, you know, there's a laugh for everybody in there. All right, Anthony, that's what's going on with BGA. Let's talk about what's going on with our listeners. What's our question of the week? Question of the week this week is, what's a game that gets better with one minor change? So just one small tweak. And I didn't specify whether it was like something you change with a house rule or if it comes from an expansion. Uh, just like a one small adjustment that makes the game infinitely better, right? So got a bunch of really good responses here. Uh, Brian mentions that with Space Base, they do an additional roll between player turns that everybody would activate on uh, to speed up the game, which drags a lot in the early stages, which it 100% does. <laughs> like Similar to Machi Koro or really any of these games like this, Space Base is very good, but the first like half of the game is just long and boring and half the dice rolls don't do anything for you. So I'm all for this. Um, whether it's balanced or not, who knows, but it sounds fun. Uh, AC mentions Tapestry. So they play with the house rule that during income turns only, you can draw two tapestry cards, choose one and discard the other. I, I'm i 100% okay with this, especially on tapestry, because tapestry is a game where the tapestry cards matter, the civilization cards matter. And if you draw the wrong ones and it just doesn't fit what you're doing, you're at a disadvantage compared to other people. So it's always tough when you draw that one card and you're like, sweet, I already have two of these. I can't use those either. Cool, you know? There's a lot of games like that where adding just a draw to discard one can really help tamp down the randomness of the draw uh, for people who don't like that. Michael mentions Terra Mystica um, and how the expansion added a turn order board that fixed a lot of issues with the base game. So again, like throwing an expansion in there that just kind of tweaks the one little thing is always a useful thing to do. Uh, Drew just asks, can we eliminate feeding our people entirely? Can we? Anybody? <laughs> I think we all would like to. Yeah, I'm for it. I'm good. Um, <laughs> and then Andre mentioned one that I was going to bring up as well. Uh, but except, accepting that all games have a draft in place instead of random draw, like Agricola. Sure. So for me, it's Terraforming Mars, where I actually don't enjoy the game a whole bunch if you play with the base rules where you don't draft half the draft in that game like without a draft there's it's too easy to pull four cards that you can't use at all that's a big one for me as well yeah i, I think that the draft is kind of a given especially with terraforming mars for me the thing that you know can break a game is when you have games that have different player powers to start the game with 
And if you play the game a couple of times, those can come a little bit old, especially if you end up with the same things over and over again. So when we play Seven Wonders, you get to select your boards. Why not? Unless there's, you know, really jockeying for a certain board, they're pretty well balanced. And the same thing with Lords of Waterdeep. You get this hidden lord. And again, I'm not, you know, 100% sure how much it throws the game off, but you're given multiple lords to choose from. So just like with Seven Wonders, you have multiple choices. The same thing with Lords of Waterdeep. Here's multiple lords. Because sometimes you want to play with the expansion lords, or maybe you play with the same lord multiple times, and you just don't want to build buildings. You want to do something different. So it doesn't hurt the game. It just gives you more initial choices that I think that makes the game a lot more fun. Because I love replayability in a game, but you don't always get to replay with different stuff. And I really want to play with different stuff. All right, so that's everything that's going on with our listeners. Let's get on. All right, so that's everything that's going on with our listeners. If you'd like to let us know what you do with your games, how you house rule it, and how you change things up, please let us know on any one of our multiple, multiple social media channels or exactly where you're listening to this. So if you are on a podcast player, please hit us up, drop us a review, hit us with some stars. Or if you're on YouTube, drop a comment, like, subscribe, all those fun things. And again, these questions are always up on Facebook and Twitter. You can find us on our guild on Board Game Geek, and especially one of the best board game websites out there. I challenge you to find a better, BoardGamersAnonymous.com. There is a tremendous amount of content out there. Please check it out. All right, Anthony, so that's everything that's going on. Let's get on to the games that we want to hit the table. Let's talk about our acquisition disorders. All right, yeah, it is a huge week for Kickstarter. There's a ton of stuff on there. So I tried to find something that was not one of the big meaty names. Um, And one that popped up that I didn't even know was coming, I'm very excited about, is the Tokyo series expansions from Jordan Draper. These are expansions for two of his games that have come out in two separate Kickstarters in the past. The first is Tokyo Metro, which was a few years ago, and the second is Tokyo Tsukiji, which came out, I believe, last year. And these are, if you've ever seen the boxes in the wild, it is a very, very compressed game. Like these boxes are maybe the size of like Hardback or, you know, Burgle Brothers, like the Fowers Brothers boxes. And a lot is jammed in here. So in the case of Tokyo Metro, you have a economic train game in which you take it's a worker placement where you're placing your different workers out on different actions, which will allow you to move along the track uh, to invest in different companies or stocks that you can pick up. You can move up on different areas. You can get bicycles that let you move faster. There's all these different things you can do both on the board and in the economy. And then you're trying to just make the most efficient use of the tracks that are out there um, to generate cash both for yourself and for the company, and move them up the stock market. Other people can buy into it, but it's not like as robust as an 18xx game. It's pretty board gamey with a stock element, which is really fun. I've owned this one for a few years and just got a chance to play it uh, a couple months before we all got locked down. A friend Ryan picked it up and we all got a chance to play and had a blast with it. It was a lot of fun and I'm really glad I own it now. And now there's an expansion. So this one is Osaka Metro, which adds... A different board and in the case of these games what's really cool is the board is fabric so it folds up really nice and tight um, when you do play you want to flatten it as much as you can you maybe iron it but it is a pretty good sized board and it fits tiny into this little box you have new lines of course new trains different action cards so it's taking the core mechanics of tokyo metro and just building kind of a standalone separate way to play it but a little bit of integration between the two It's going to be a little bit faster, a little bit quicker than Tokyo, which is not a super long game, um, but this map's a little smaller. So I'm excited for that and have already backed it, of course, (laughs) because it looks good. (laughs) The other one, Tokyo Tsukiji, is an open economic game. So this one is pure economics. There's no board to it. There's no worker placement or anything like that. This one, you look at it and you see the mechanics and if you're not like into economic board games, you're like, where's the game? I don't know what I'm doing here. (laughs) So it's almost a simulation in how it actually plays out. And so what you're doing is you're getting licenses for different fish markets to be able to go out on your boats and 
fish for different types of things. So in the base game, there's like crabs and tuna and eel. There's like, I don't know, eight or nine different types of fish that are available in the markets. And they each have their own little meeple that looks like that type of fish. The ships that you get will be different sizes and you'll have various actions you can take with the fit with the ships. They go out, you can put fish barrels onto the ships. You bring them back. You can either store them or you can sell them or other people have to buy things from you for you to be able to transfer it into um, actual elements that can be used in the game. And that makes things tricky because what you set the price at will determine if they buy it or not. They're only going to score if they do buy it and you're only going to get the money if they buy it. So you have to be very, it's entirely player driven economy, which is just kind of a fun psychological thing that can break, but in a good way, if somebody decides to be a jerk about it, (laughs) as is often the case in these games. The expansion includes six new markets. So just expanding the variety of what you can get, Um, 31 new licenses, a whole bunch of new barrels. Uh, Six new gray markets, which are just like special powers and abilities that come out during the game. Some more ships. So it just makes the game, which is already very modular, more modular and introduces some new ideas. Like the market can crash, for example, if you overfish. Um, Whereas before, like if you overfished, things would just close and that would be it. But now you actually lose resources if that happens because of you were too aggressive and you know you crash the market a very interesting kind of game that haven't really seen a lot of people talk about and is a good lightish game for people who are into you know like the economic simulators um you know like arc Riot or your 18xx but maybe one third as long <laughs> so that is up on kickstarter right now uh the pair of them and you can get those i think they're shipping sometime next year it's up for the next three weeks so you have plenty of time to back it So the Osaka Metro expansion for Tokyo Metro and the Tokyo Tsukiji expansion. And then um, a few add-ons on there as well that you can pick up for either of the games, including the little metal currency that they do, which is always pretty cool. Yeah, I've always liked the look at this when he had his original Kickstarter effort. It just seems so much. It seemed like so many different components to it and not a traditional kind of board game look to it. So I wasn't really sure what to back and you know what was actually good because there was so much of it out there and some of it just seemed like hey these are really adorable little pieces you can play with and i really wasn't sure how much of the gameplay actually came through yeah yeah and the trickiest thing and i i don't know i don't know how it turned out for him so i can't say it was a bad decision but in both of those kickstarters there was multiple games so yeah like the tokyo metro one which i backed it had Tokyo Metro um, and Tokyo Jitaku, which is like the tile lane game that turned into Mega City Oceania. And then there was a third game about like, I can't remember. It was like soda bottles or something. I never played it, but I backed all three together. (laughs) Yeah. And just those other two were a little wonky and a little bit smaller boxes. So I think I started there and I was just like, ah, I don't know about these. So I never actually played Tokyo Metro, even though it was on my shelf for years. And the same thing happened with um, Tokyo Tsukiji. It shipped with a couple of other games, like I think Coin Laundry and um, Game Show or something, which is like more of a party game. Very, very different genres of game. So it'd be very easy to look at that Kickstarter, say, I don't know what any of this is. I'm not going to back just whatever, you know, if, if and then later on when people start talking about it, you're like, oh, OK, cool, which is what happened to me. So it's nice that he's kind of consolidated it. And they're like, here's the two big heavy games. <laughs> And here's the expansions for them. And they're together, but they should go together because these are the types of games that you will want if you are into heavier games. All right, cool. Well, I have a game that has nothing to do with strategy or tactics, so to speak. It has all to do with really cute stuff and a, a ton of nostalgia. This is Catapult Kingdoms. Ready, aim, launch, build your castle, set up your troops, load your catapults, and use your cunning tactics all right, to conquer the floor. <laughs> so this, if you, depending on your age bracket, this is a game you should be pretty familiar with it. This is, I guess, the legally distinct version of Crossbows and, and uh, Catapults, which was a game that as a child I did have. I think, I, I believe I remember having memories of this, which was all about these really kind of light plastic pieces that you would build up this little castle wall 
and you are trying to protect this one spot on the board, and then you shot these discs over either with the crossbows or catapults, knocking down the castle and hopefully landing your disc directly on, I guess, the king spot to win the game. So here comes Catapult Kingdoms. I guess I always had thought that uh, Restoration Games would have come out with it, but here's a legally distinct version of it. And it is by a small publisher, but a publisher um, that has produced many games before, so it's pretty legit. And again, it's pretty much crossbows and catapults. So what you'll be doing is you'll be building up your castle walls. So you have this one castle facing wall with these different kind of Lego brick kind of components. Not as good as Lego bricks, but nonetheless. So you set up the wall, you set up your figures, and then using action cards in the game, it will allow you to fling over rubber boulders. Little tiny little marble-like size <laughs> boulders, so to speak, or shoot them over using the ballistas in the game. There's also mighty plungers, which basically are kind of a quasi-battering ram in the game. And you're trying to knock down as many figures as possible before all your figures get knocked down. First one who knocks down all the figures wins the game. I'm going to be honest. I find this adorable. This is interesting because it's a piece of childhood that I remember. But looking again at the game, it's two pages. So basically, you build up your castle in any format that you want. You set your figures up in any format you want. You play your cards, which will let you do a number of different things, including rebuilding your walls, marching your characters, which basically moving means moving things around, shoot multiple catapults throughout the game, take cards from your opponent, or even use, I guess, probably what's the most fun action is a traitor action, which you can actually, I guess, utilize one of their own catapults and actually take down their castle from behind enemy lines. So again, if this kind of like knocks on your nostalgia, or if you have a family that likes, you know, knocking <laughs> random bricks over with little rubber, you know, marbles, so to speak, this might be for you. It's cute, it's fun, and, you know, surprisingly enough, it's it's reasonably priced. It's $60 for the game, the base game, and the expansion. You really need both because you want all of the different ways to kind of knock down the towers. This campaign will wrap up on Monday, July 27th. So if you are interested, check it out. You gotta love the power of nostalgia. Cause like you described this, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> like, yeah. All these games that I did play in the eighties, I'm like, yes, give it to me. And the ones that I, I never got a chance to play or didn't even know exist. I'm like, why would I, why would I do this? Why am I paying for this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I guess there's, there's something to be said you know, for a tried and true concept. And I had seen this pop up and honestly didn't really, it didn't really stir me, so to speak. I'm like, oh, I recognize that. And even as a kid, I recognized how thin of a game that was. But, you know, some other people started getting into it. So I said, you know, what? let me take a second look at it. It does look like quality components. And that's pretty much the game. It's about knocking stuff down. So, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, it's currently up on Kickstarter. All right, so that's everything that's going on at the table. If it's able to knock down all of the pieces, let's get into the games that actually hit the table, Anthony, and we'll let people know if those games are a buy and they should run out and pick those games up, if those games are a play and they should sit down and play them, or if those games are a dodge and they should avoid them all costs, or if those games are the dreaded burn and they should destroy them with childhood catapults. So what do you have for us, Anthony? All right, I have a new game from Cosmos called The Liberation of Wraithburg. This is a game that takes place in the Legends of Andor universe, and it's designed by Gerhard Hecht, who he's worked in this universe before. Um, he had like a German only, like the Legends of Andor kind of expansion type thing. But he also designed Kashgar, Merchants of the Silk Road, which is a very underrated and rarely talked about game that got reprinted by uh, Holy Grail Games maybe two, three years ago. I love that game. So I was actually pretty excited to play this. Cosmos sent me a copy to take a look at. I got a chance to play it a handful of times, actually, because it's very quick. And I'm, I have mixed feelings. So <laughs> let me run through why that is. The game itself is a co-op, 
And it's not like Legends of Andor at all. This is more like a puzzly kill all the monsters, kind of defend your stuff uh, co-op. Every person who plays will get a hand of three or four cards. Each of those cards will have one of three actions on them. You will play one of your cards and take one of those actions. And you can get new cards later in the game, like friend cards that add to this deck. So you'll have more. Once you run out of cards, you'll take an action that will bring all those cards back into your hand. And that's when monsters will spawn. You'll pull cards off of the spawn deck and new ones will spawn on the board. So it's kind of like Pandemic in that there's always new stuff coming out and it scales based on the number of players. But it doesn't happen every round. It happens when you run out of actions. So you actually get three or four actions before it's going to trigger. But some of those actions may not actually kill any of the monsters you might be building things up or moving you might just move it's kind of tricky in that way so what you have is a board with the castle there are six different treasure cards or task cards i think they're called and then you put monsters on top of them you have to clear all the monsters off of the card then flip over the task card complete the task it'll be like do xyz have these things you've already defeated you know turn in these monsters this many monsters of this type to complete this whatever it might be um, there's a few different things that it could be to win the game. You have to complete four of the six tasks and it's not particularly easy to do so. But part of the reason it's not easy to do so is because you don't know what's going to come out. Some of the cards in the monster deck are actually just artifacts that you can just take for free. Some are good. Some are bad. Some of the monsters are much harder to kill. So you need to get like multiple people to that spot to attack them. And honestly, looking at the game, I was, I almost didn't want to play it. Like I set it up. It was very thin. I read the rule book and I'm like, man, this doesn't look very good. <laughs> like, I didn't think I was going to enjoy it at all. But it does have a bit of a puzzle to it. And I feel like it does, despite the fact that it is a pure co-op, almost abstractly so, it has that Andor puzzliness that I love so much about Legends of Andor that makes that game more than just an adventure game. It makes it like a puzzle type of adventure game. This is more than just another co-op game. It's a puzzle. I mean, and most of those co-op games are puzzles, but this one's very tight and small and contained. So I don't think it's a great game because it is derivative in a few ways and it doesn't have a ton of content in it, but you do have asymmetrical characters. They each have their own power. You have like a you know, mage with spells. You have the archer who has like quivers that they use for damage, like these special things that can come out. There's a lot of variability in the tasks you have to complete and the puzzle itself and trying to figure out how to use your actions and chain them together if you can is decently satisfying, especially for like a 30 minute game. So I'm going to give this one a play and I'm surprised because honestly, I didn't think I'd like it as much as I do. It is relatively inexpensive as well. I think it's a 20 to $30 game. There's not a ton in the box here. So if you really like the Legends of Andor and you really like, you know, puzzly co-ops like Pandemic then you might actually like this game. I think it might squeeze between the uh, the borders here and just f- hit me just right as somebody who likes this combination of stuff. But I rather enjoyed it, and I, I think it'll be a good fit with the kids as well. So Liberation of Reitberg, it has some issues in that it's not the most original or interesting um, take on this kind of co-op formula. But what it does, it does well. And it kind of fits into that Andor universe, which I like so much. So I give it a play. Check it out. And so you're saying as far as this, this can play with the family or can you give me an idea of like age range on this? I know it's a co-op, so you can, you can kind of alpha game in it, but is this something that the kids can kind of like competently play out their own actions? Yeah. Yeah. I think so because there's only really three or four actions that you can take. Um, You only have three cards. Everything can be open information. And there's very little text on anything. There's some text on the task cards, but most of it's icon driven. So once the kids know what the icons are and they know what they're trying to do, and if you give them a little bit of a nudge every now and then, like, hey, we really want to go after that monster kind of thing. (laughs) um, Yeah. Then, yeah, I think it'd be good for them. Like I've played Pandemic with my kids and it went fine. It's just a little too abstract for them. So this one, like they're actually fighting monsters, I think they would have a little bit more fun. All right. Well, we recently did our top 10 Feld games. And if you are a Feld fan, you know that there is no such thing as a bad Feld game. Eh, Probably. Uh, It's just a matter of how epic Feld tends to be. Uh, Feld is one of the board game designers that has one of the most deepest and widest breadth of 
games out there as far as mechanics are concerned. And when we talked about those games out there, they just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. One of the games is not the most epic of Feld games, but one of the games that's the most colorful and different of the Feld games is Aquasphere. Aquasphere, you know, came back, came out in the day from uh, Pegaspiel back in 2014. It was a Kickstarter, so you had your Kickstarter backers for it. And I think there was some challenge where it went on Kickstarter and then just did not get the publicity that it deserved when it actually hit the retail market. So there was a lot of copies floating around that weren't being shown any love. I think way back when I picked this up and I picked a copy up for Dave because it was on sale and it was a Feld game. So we were amazed because when this came out on Kickstarter, it was such a big thing. And then with the Kickstarter dragging off, no one knew that this was actually hitting the market. And it finally did. And I was happy to pick up a Feld game at a discount. And as I said, Aquasphere is one of these really colorful, dynamic games because it involves so many different mechanics. First off, one of the main mechanics about the game because you are dealing with this fabulous aquasphere, a really interesting, all these round circles, these bathospheres, these little scientific laboratories that connect to create this larger aquasphere. And as you're exploring the ocean depths, different things kind of occur, and you're trying to create and research and score the most knowledge that you possibly can in the game by building up your own little bathosphere, by landing your submarines in the different bathospheres on top of the aquasphere so that you have more exploring, by utilizing your robots to explore, research, get new materials, get more time, because that's going to be a very important component of the game, and deal with the different octopods that come on the different stations. So as you're doing this, the main mechanic to make those things happen is a programming board. Now, most programming games are either a solid miss or once in a while the hit because when you program things, you are really stuck. This programming board is very forgiving for a couple of reasons. First off, the programming board changes every round. So basically what you do is you have your scientist and they're deciding how to program their robots. So you make one of two decisions on what area you're going to program your robot. You take a robot from the bottom of your player board, you program on on the action. Then you get another two choices to go, you know, which side you want to program. And then finally, another final two. So you are being kept away from certain options. But as I said, if you've built a certain strategy, not to worry because those icons and which those different areas are activated in, you know, sequential order are going to change. The programming bots are now ready to go. If for some reason you weren't able to program a bot to do what you want, you can spend time to actually program an additional robot for that round. Once those robots are programmed, based upon where your scientist happens to be in the larger aquasphere, you'll be able to take the action to, again, take time, which is a resource in this game, to move your scientists around, deploy your submarines, train up or program up your robots to be able to take additional actions throughout the game. So you're doing that throughout. You're dealing with these crystals. They're going to help you get past your different victory point lines. It's also going to score you points in the game. And one of my favorite features about this game is you're going to be able to build up your own little bathosphere, which is going to allow you to take more of these kind of components throughout the game. And there's also additional action cards. Some of them are instantaneous. Some of them are will help you with movement. And some of them will just score you points throughout the game. So as you program your robots, as they go about their activities, as they score you points, so your knowledge grows throughout the game, the programming board changes, the board kind of refills throughout the game, and you're trying to score the most knowledge points possible. Lots of ways to win this game. It isn't a pure point salad game, but there are a lot of ways to win uh, Aquasphere. So again, this is a game I've I've enjoyed playing. Again, very colorful, very different for a Fell type of game. And 
it was a buy back then, and it's still a buy for me. It's a lot of fun. It does play best at the higher player count because there is a mechanic when you're programming your bots, they take center stage in one of the bathysphere areas, and then they can get knocked out. So if you don't have the higher player count, you're not really enjoying that kind of like, oh, he took over my area, and I don't have that area control situation. So a lot of engaging fun and a lot of interesting choices and a great, great aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, this we're going to talk about this in the next uh, section, but we actually played this remotely because we both own a copy. And I have owned it since the Kickstarter. I backed it on the Kickstarter back when Stefan Felt was new and exciting to me. And I have owned this game now since January 2015, and I had never played it. So <laughs> I don't, I think it's partially like, my local game group's not, you know, a bunch of Feld fans. And it just came at the wrong time. It was like right after my daughter was born. I wasn't playing anything. So I'm really, really glad we finally got to play it because I this is fantastic. I had a lot of fun with it. And it's not, it feels like a Feld, but it doesn't feel like the same formula kind of ground down into a new set of mechanics. It has a unique feeling to it. And it really was interesting to see this very like programming light approach to everything. So I had a lot of fun with it. All right. So that's everything that's hitting our table. Let's get on to our feature review. So for our feature review this week, we are giving you a guide to playing games remotely. And we have three steps that will help you guide you through the process to let you know how to get those board games off the shelf and onto the table and being able to play remotely. What do you think, Anthony? I thought about it a little bit and I'd actually done it once before with Jason from Every Night is Game Night. We did a uh, a live playthrough on YouTube, which you can actually go find. It's still there, of First Martians, back when that first came out. And it didn't go great. We had a bunch of technical problems. One of the cameras died at some point. But it was still really fun, because it was like over Christmas break, or maybe it was at some point where my family was out of town, so I was home alone. And it was just fun to get to hang out with somebody that I don't normally get to see, because he was in Connecticut. And it was very novel at the time in the middle of a pandemic. That's it's less novel now. because <laughs> All my interactions are remote. But yeah, getting a chance to physically put a game on the table and interact with people that you don't get to see anymore and interact with components that you don't get to touch anymore. It was it's a lot of fun. And I think a lot of people are turned off at the idea of it because it seems like a lot of work as well. And part of that is you need to make the right decisions on the games you play, how you're going to play them, how you're going to set it all up, which is why we figured we'd put this episode together to kind of talk. All right. So if you want to get those games to the table and you do have a way to kind of put them remotely online so everyone can get to the table, here are three great steps to, to go through. Here are three important steps to go through first in order to get those games to the table. So first up, choosing a game. Anthony, you remember choosing a game when we went through all of our collections to find the uh, – <laughs> The perfect games to hit the table remotely. Yeah, it was fun. And it part of it, I mean, I feel like we cheated a little, at least I did, because I had already gone through my entire collection, building out my lists for the bonus episodes on Patreon. Sure. <laughs> so I'd already culled my whole list on BGG, and I knew it was up to date, and I knew everything I said I owned, I did own. My only challenge was some of these games that I own, I don't know where they are. They're downstairs, they're in my <laughs> bedroom, they're in my closet, they're in one of these boxes. I don't know. So I had to like go through and make sure I knew where everything was that I was going to recommend and then try to remember all these games, some of which I hadn't played in a long time or at all, and think, does this game have any hidden information? Because that's the big that's a big no, no, obviously. Does this game have a shared deck where we would need to draw from the same shuffled materials, uh, which also doesn't work remotely? and do I have a version of the game that will match up with the version you have? Because sure. maybe we both have the same game, but, oh, I have the deluxe Kickstarter edition with the new rules, and you have the first edition with the older rules, and <laughs> I don't know that they match up at all, you know? Sure. So, and honestly, even when you think you have the exact same version of the game, just double check, because we were playing Aquasphere, and we had a very rousing conversation about the placement of the scoring lines on the score track because they were different for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. If you know why, please let us know because that was really, really strange that that actually uh, you had were like, two different boards of that. 
Yeah, we were like gaslighting each other at the same time. You're like, no, <laughs> it's at 37. You're like, no, it's at 38. <laughs> you can only imagine someone overhearing that conversation. You're like, that, that, these guys are going insane. <laughs> so yeah, the versions matter. Make sure you have the right additions that match up. Obviously, the rules are important. That usually goes in long lines with the version, as, as you mentioned, Anthony. And, uh, you know, the components. Sometimes, like you said, there's different components, especially the higher grade kind of stuff that's out there. And that might change gameplay ever so slightly. Sometimes Kickstarter, I think it was Clans of Caldonia had a couple of Kickstarter, you know, starting clans that were not so well tested. So if for some reason you gave out those starting clans and you got one of those Kickstarter ones, it might throw the game a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's and, tricky, I think, in that way, because so many games come in like even games that maybe are identical, but like a second edition will just make a couple small tweaks or sure. yeah, Kickstarter has like one or two tiles like Clans of Caledonia. You just got to double check that stuff and make sure you know what version of a game you have. Yeah, and there's a lot of games where scoring has changed and they'll ch score something differently at the end of the game because it was scoring so many points and they went back and they tweaked that. So you might be playing the game and going, oh, I'm doing all these things and no, 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 not according to my scoring board, you are not. So <laughs> there's a lot of challenges as far as that's concerned. Yeah, I was just going to kind of like real quickly run through like kind of the, the different types of games that ended up on my list because... I know a lot of people will be listening to this and be like, okay, but still, which games can I play remotely? And obviously we don't have like a perfect list because we just have the games we own, but there are certain types of games. There are Euros with no shared anything, right? Where you're basically multiplayer solitaire type of games. Mm -hmm. um, and I hate that phrase, but I feel like it works in this particular case. Like a lot of Felds, your Russian Railroads, your... Marco Polo's, you know, even like those worker placement games, those are easy to like kind of sync up, which we'll get to. You have your big asymmetrical two player games, which we listed a bunch of those, like War of the Ring or Star Wars Rebellion, where again, we'll get to it, but you have to worry about board control. But otherwise, all of the components you have are yours. So it doesn't matter who the other person has. And then you have like games where you have like your own deck of things. So maybe like an LCG or a Star Wars Destiny or. Uh, a key forge or something like that. I know a lot of people play magic online and have for years over Skype. And I think that type of game in particular fits well with this. So there's obviously a bunch of other stuff, but that's some of the games we kind of identified that would be a good fit. Yeah. A remote friendly game has to be something that you can actually play remote. If you are using a joint deck and you're pulling cards secretly or you're drafting cards, that's obviously something you can't do remotely. So, you know, I think if you logically kind of think out the steps in the game and see where some of those secretive kind of situations or joint deck situations might come into play, I think you can avoid a lot of that kind of problematic gameplay. As Anthony said, solo, solitaire Euro games are often looked down upon, but in this case, they actually might play out quite well. All right, so now that you've identified what game you want to play, considering the version, the rules, the components, and if the game is remote friendly, as Anthony mentioned, all those different games, now you want to take a look on how to play the game. And we have identified three different methods to play the board game remotely. The first way to play the game remotely is going to be utilizing a single board. So one person would set up the entire game, the main board, all the components, all the player stuff, everything that's needed. They open their copy, and the setup is completely on their side. Every other player has nothing but a video screen that they will allow them to see what's going on at that player's table. So that main player who has the board and all the setup has to make all the moves from everyone there. This, again, goes back to the idea of what game is remote friendly. So in this version, it has to be a game that has all open information throughout the game, unless you tweak it somehow. But generally, all open information is preferable here. So everybody else is telling the main person what to do, what to move, how to move it. Okay. Obviously, this is the most you know preferable method because one person can have the game and orchestrate all of the things in the game. 
everybody else just kind of sits back and enjoys the experience. But maybe you want to have more control over your own components. But in this case here, you're going to need to have your own copy of the game. So method two, if you're looking to play the game with your own board and components, or at least your own player board or components, you and everyone else need to have a copy of the game. So again, you're still having that one main player set up the main board, and then you are setting up your own components, your own player board, your own materials throughout the game. So you can manipulate your own player section, but when it comes to utilizing a situation where where things are played in the middle or how things are shared in the middle, that then goes back to the main player. So you say, well, I'm moving this, I'm programming this, I'm manipulating this, I'm switching these resources, and then I move to this spot. And then the main person who has the board, they're doing that action there. Finally, the third way to play the game is everyone gets a board. So in this case, what you're doing is you're mirroring each other's board setups. So you have to set up the board, you have to set up your player stuff, all the materials, all the cards. Every player has to do that. Once they do, if you take a move on your side, then you have to let everyone know explicitly, I've done X, Y, and Z. Now, this is going to be the most engaging, most tactile, because you'll have everything in front of you. You'll be able to move and manipulate all your pieces, but it's going to take the longest amount of time to play out because everyone has to be able to move those things on their boards as well in order to keep track of what you're doing. So again, either you go with a single person who has all the boards, all the materials, or you go with one person having the main board and the main materials, and you have your own player board and own player materials, or three, everyone gets the boards, everyone gets the materials, and everyone mirrors each other. Yeah, yeah, so this is tricky, because for me personally, I would prefer to have my own stuff, but I know that's what we did with Aquasphere, and it was difficult in several ways. One being that we weren't always perfectly synced up. Like if one of us didn't quite hear what somebody was saying or didn't move something in the right direction, we're like, wait, how do you have that much time? Oh, cause you did. Okay, fine. And yo, oh, you took that card, not this card. Okay. And so I can imagine with like three or four people that could become a nightmare. <laughs> like everybody's going to have a different board state at all times. So I feel like you, you will talk about this in step three, but the technology setup would be very important for that. The first version like you said, probably makes the most sense in terms of just keeping everything clean. But that means only one person's getting the tactile part of it. Everybody else is just playing through a screen again, which again, it's not really why we want to do this. So it's difficult, I think, to know exactly which one's best. I think it's going to depend on your preferences, your game group, and probably the game that you're playing, like how complex it is. Because we did King of Tokyo, and it didn't matter. It was very easy to just be like, Oh, I'm in Tokyo now. Okay, I'm in Tokyo now. <laughs> like, that's that's the board state. That's all that matters. Everything else is on your own side. And occasionally having to dig through the deck and find a card. With more complex games, though, probably the first or the second one are going to make the most sense, um, whether you like it or not. So I, like I mentioned, the big asymmetrical two-player games like Star Wars Rebellion or War of the Ring. I don't know that I'd want to have boards on both sides trying to keep those synced up versus just sure. one person uh, with a good camera on it because it, it might become a headache. And that brings us to our last step, which is technology setup. So as we mentioned before, the technology setup is going to go in line with our second step on how do you actually play the game. So if you play with a single board setup where one person has all of the components, including the main board, then you do need to have a camera you know, that can capture all of that, not just, oh, that's a generally nice picture from like, 12 feet above, but has the ability to kind of either zoom in or can, based upon the game, have all the components in focus so that you can read and determine and identify everything on the board space. It's a little bit challenging because you have to have everything on the board space underneath the camera, but it is doable. We were able to do, as you mentioned, Anthony, King of Tokyo with my iPhone. We were able to use FaceTime and that was able to get the board state, and based upon what area we were able to kind of cobble together, you could show all the components, all the dice, everything that was needed in that space. Obviously, the larger the game, the better camera setup you're going to need. You might need a zoom. It's a little more challenging as far as that's concerned. 
Next, the board and components. So we talked about where, again, one main player is going to have a board and everyone else is going to have their own player pieces in their boards. Again, it depends on what game you're playing. Here, the technology requirements, the camera requirements aren't as extreme as covering an entire game setup. So a lesser camera will do, a smaller field of vision will do, because you have your own stuff to look at here, so you don't necessarily need to have everyone's stuff at the table. And finally, if you have your entire boards, personal stuff, components, supply, everything that goes along with the game, then you don't need any fancy camera setup. You probably just want to have a video where you could see each other, maybe Skype or Zoom or WebEx, just so that you could talk to each other throughout the game. You need, obviously, a good audio connection because you're going to be describing what you're doing on your board so everyone can mirror that. It's obviously the longest kind of version here, but depending on the game, it might be the most fun because you have everything in front of you. And again, the technology requirements are very, very small. You can even do this over a phone call. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the thing, like everybody thinks like, oh, I need to get a camera rig and have everything hooked up and have all these fancy cam. You really don't. Like, honestly, I could see doing this with just a phone or an iPad and just move it around and be like, this is what I did. Do you see? <laughs> And it, it might be give people a bit of a vertigo, but it would work, right? You don't need sure. cameras everywhere to do all this. So, you know, I know we do a podcast every week and we have all this media we put up, but we're not really video guys, not yet anyways. So we don't have any of this equipment. We're probably in the same boat as most of you. We have webcams yes. we have phones, and we made it work. <laughs> so. Absolutely. So this kind of remote gaming has been going on for years. Obviously, chess is pretty famous for it. I think I remember even seeing Bridge in the, the local newspaper. Diplomacy is often played via email. So there's a lot of ways to give information to other players about what your movements are on the board, what you're doing, how you're scoring points, but also gives you the tactile feel of actually playing a board game. So please uh, check out all of these different steps and all the games in your collections. Maybe you can find something that would be great to get to the table. What some people, you know, virtually... That will make you feel like they're close to home. All right, that's everything for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at our remote table. <laughs>